Okay, thank you so much uh, for that introduction. I'm just gonna wait until the rest of the panelists are here. And it looks like we're all here. Um, so hello everyone, and thank you for attending today's panel session, Curating in a Decentered World. My name is Emily McKibben, and I'm the Associate Director and Senior Curator at the McLaren Arts Centre in Barrie, Ontario, which is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek, which include the Odawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi Nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. Uh, I'm very grateful today to Lucy and Judith and the AMC uh, Conference Organizing Committee for creating this digital platform for us to share insight today. I also wanted to thank my brilliant panelists, Emily Changer, uh, Tony Willard and Elisa Kowish, who is a panelist as well as a co-organizer of the session. I'd also like to thank Andrea Fatona and Ann Wolf, who won't be joining us today, but have contributed to this conversation. I'm not going to revisit the abstract, except to say that I hope we can discuss some aspects of our current situation in our discussion after the presentations and how this new situation might encourage or shape a decentered curatorial approach both now and as our museums and galleries slowly start to reopen to the public. Emily, Tanya, and Elisa will each pre present on their practices, and afterwards I will moderate a discussion between these three remarkable speakers. After about 45 minutes, I will open up the discussion to the audience, so please do feel free to send questions as they come up, and I will collate those for the uh, speakers in the discussion. I've also been asked to keep all questions anonymous, so please don't be offended if I omit any potentially identifying information when I share your questions with the panelists. Um, I've also been asked to note that all viewpoints expressed here are those of each individual speaker and do not reflect the opinions of viewpoints of AMC or AMC Foundation. I'll give a brief bio for the speakers in the order in which they'll present. Um, and if you wanna see the full bio, I encourage you to take a look at the conference catalog. Our first speaker is Emily Changer, uh, who's an artist and an award-winning curator and writer, uh, currently working at the Art Gallery of York University. She is known for her process-based participatory curatorial practice, the commissioning of complex works across all media, and the creation of long-term collaborative projects performatively staged within and outside the gallery context. Tanya Willard of Sufopmic and Settle and pardon me, Settler Heritage works within the shifting ideas around contemporary and traditional often working with bodies of knowledge and skills that are conceptually linked to her interest in intersections between Aboriginal and other cultures. Uh, Willard is an associate professor in visual arts at the Faculty of Creative and Critical Studies at UBC Okanagan and a truly remarkable artist as well. Eliza Kowish is a Toronto-based curator who has held positions in both the public and private sector since 2004. Her practice focuses on contemporary art and regional programming, prioritizing artists and artworks that connect meaningfully to the location where the art is presented. Eliza is the outgoing curator at Latcham Art Centre in Stouffville, Ontario, and formerly the senior associate curator for the Bank of Montreal's corporate art collection. And with that, I'll pass it on to Emily. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the beautiful introduction. Just going to share my screen. So I'll start by saying that I like to think that working on the so-called periphery in the underserviced suburbs of Toronto, on the edge, in fact, of what discursively frames the place where I work as the periphery, that is downtown Toronto, has off-centered my curating. I like to think of this as the edge because this is a threshold that I can get behind getting over. That is to say that the discourse of center periphery is not an easy jumping off point for me because I value my locale as a site of artistic innovation. So by getting over, I mean getting to a place of no return and the start of something new, no longer tethered by the binary center periphery shapes. Indeed, not, by not operating at the so-called center means that the methodologies that I employ as a curator no longer have to come from there either. It is from a place of multiplicity, of shifting geographies, of submerged cultural forms, and of new gestalt configurations because this off-centered curating also changes what is in the foreground and what is in the background too that I will now speak to some of the specificities of my work and offer some examples. Well, Emily, sorry, uh -huh. just a moment. You're, you're showing me, I think, a whiteboard on the back. I think we are not seeing your, your screen. You're not. 
Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry to interrupt. That's okay. (laughs) Interrupt now. Well, it's it's what happens when we're first, I guess. Danger Um, going first. Give me one second. Lisa says might be sharing the whiteboard, but I'm not sharing. Let me new let me newly share it then. I can also share it on my end if you like. He sent it to me too. Interesting. Oh, there, there we go. Is that work? Mm-hmm, that's perfect. Okay, excellent. But I haven't shared any images, just my name <laughs> and my locality. Um, So just to jump right in, um, my work over the past 17 years operates between two interconnected practices that have become increasingly entangled. One is the creation of long-term alliances between the gallery, artists, community groups, and our locality through socially engaged residency style projects, and the other, through these, the social and civic transformation of the contemporary art gallery. Both are concerned with, one, questioning the social and civic role of art in its public institutions, Two, contributing to the future visual culture of Toronto by reimagining popular or vernacular traditions, which includes the constitution of new traditions formed through cultural mixing. And three, conceiving of the curatorial as a means of participating in the civic sphere by bringing artists, non-artists, and civic structures into relation. To do this, I work for very long periods of time, like two to three years on single, albeit multifaceted and process-driven projects. Over the years, the institution that I work for, the AGYU, has had to bend to meet the methodological demands of these projects and change itself in relation. Institutional transformation through collaborative projects that value different cultural protocols, processes, and perspectives is a practice that I now call inReach. My long-term approach to social engagement and institutional transformation vis-a-vis inReach stems, for instance, from my now decade-long collaboration with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, beginning in 2009 with the awakening, or Gigo Goshman in the Ojibwe language. Gigo Goshman brought together members of the Mississaugas and a group of parkour athletes from suburban Toronto in a new civic ceremony staged at the Walker Court at the Art Gallery of Ontario on May 14th, 2011. This was an early project of mine. Back then, I still believed that it was important to return to the center for legitimization. I call this form of institutional transformation in reach because the differing ecologies of knowledge these kinds of projects produce change institutional practice from within, as institutions must adopt to the challenges and surprises that emerge in their making. For the awakening, it meant radically rethinking the temporality of projects, including thinking holistically about how a gallery views its own trajectory from a project by project timeline to a seamless, ever-evolving entity where change is not always visible in spatial or representational terms. This began a process at the AGYU that I call curating on a continuum. Even though my projects often culminate in large-scale public works that appropriate popular and recognizable dramaturgical forms in sometimes over-the-top ways, such as civic ceremonials like The Awakening or street processions like Ring of Fire, and thus perform as opportunities to recast the protagonists of these social dramas with individuals and groups who do not generally find themselves at the civic center of their city, the real work is often in the invisibility of the project's making. But rather than feeling like I have to make everything public, intelligible, or discursively acceptable to the culture of contemporary art, I consider this behind-the-scenes work as rehearsals for the creation of new social relations in Toronto on the one hand, and for new ways of participating in the civic and cultural life of Toronto on the other. Ring of Fire was a project with 150 core collaborators culminating in a 300 person street procession that took place on August 9th, 2015. A collaboration between disability dancers, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, members of the Capoeira Angola community, and young rappers from the gallery's neighborhood of Jane Finch, we used the methodology of Trinidadian mass to make the project and worked from the seven grandfather teachings to establish the project's ethics. And this is important. I am interested in modeling cultural traditions that come from performative forms of colonial cultural resistance, in particular from the Americas, as methodologies for creating new practices in contemporary art. 
The final two projects I'll point to are not only rooted in the practices of communities with whom I collaborate and continue to collaborate with, but commit to foundational shifts in the local art discourses of Toronto. These are what I call appositional projects that link peripheries to peripheries, not moving the margins to the center, but rather acknowledging that the margins create their own centers. The first is Rise, a film I commissioned in 2018 with spoken word poets and rappers from Scarborough and Jane Finch and Métis elder Duke Redbird that was shot on Toronto's new suburban subway extension, which itself represents a geographical realignment of the city of Toronto. I want to use this project to quickly illustrate two things. The first is that RISE was created in collaboration with AGYU's Truth Be Told Spoken Word Mentorship Program, which is an ongoing, now 12 year long, education program at AGYU, conceived in collaboration with our neighbours from Jane Finch. This is to highlight that working away from centre periphery dichotomies also allows us to dismantle the other hierarchies manifest in the institutions of art. Eliminating distinctions, for instance, between education, public programming, and exhibition making. Secondly, through RISE, we supported a new generation of filmmakers in Toronto, mentored poets and rappers, and most importantly, created much needed suburb to suburb solidarity, a platform to discuss themes of movement and migration. This film circulates internationally and thus strategically puts a particular image of Toronto as seen through the eyes of a new generation of cultural practitioners on the international stage. The second is an exhibition called Migrating the Margins from 2017. Migrating the Margins traced the roots of artists diasporic identities as rerouted through the vernacular cosmopolitanism of the suburbs. The exhibition also cheekily took up Toronto's post amalgamation condition by arguing for an aesthetics of an amalgamation. On the one hand, representing that which was once thought geographically to be outside the city limits, now being actually part of the center of the city. And secondly, that the artists in the show illustrate a new amalgamated aesthetic paradigm by mixing culturally specific references, techniques, and traditions with Western forms of artistic production. What I call the aesthetics of Toronto's placefulness of being at home with an elsewhere. And finally, in closing, at AGYU, we align ourselves with the artists and communities who also consider their perspectives and practices peripheral. Our role is to proliferate differences in the discourses of Toronto art by extending the geographical and cultural scope of what has traditionally defined its limits to define and elevate our local artistic context. Thank you. I guess we'll move on to uh, Tanya's presentation. Thank you so much, Emily. Great. Greetings, everyone. I'm going to start with uh, sharing my screen here. Okay. My name, number one. <laughs> Uh, well, greetings to all of you. Why kohwaita briskwas Tanya Willards, laka laweka, and in Askanlet, no sohwat mokutluk, iana, no tamiuch to sohwat mokutluk. I greet you in my language because I'm a language learner and because it relates to a lot of the work that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so I'm really, I'm really thankful to be gathered here with you. Uh, I'm actually. Um, uh, in the town of Chase, BC, near Kamloops, BC, in the interior of British Columbia. And I won't do a land acknowledgement except to say that this is where I'm from, and this is the center or the recentering of my work um, for the last uh, period, and which I'll be addressing today. Um, Uh, so, so briefly, I had a um, work in the past as a, as a curator, and I'm going to sort of contextualize my work a bit differently in this talk and concentrate on a recent project that looks at land-based uh, ways of working both as an artist and a curator and, uh, and a mother, and in fact, sort of conflating them together. Um, this is an exhibition I worked on in 2012, which toured. It was called Beat Nation, Art, Hip Hop, and Aboriginal Culture. And it was a... Uh, um, it was an exhibition that was organized actually in a very tight time frame, stemming from an artist-run center project with Grunt Gallery. 
and from work I had done as an activist uh, with Redwire magazine, a, a national uh, Indigenous youth publication. And uh, it was a really successful exhibition. It toured, it had a, a really great life. And it was the work I was engaged in at the time, which was to create space for Indigenous artists uh, within institutions and galleries and to build on, in fact, a generation before me of Indigenous artists who were significant, who made me feel like I could be reflected and included in, within these white walls. However, in that experience uh, over time, it uh, though I still very much believe in uh, the gallery space, I want to point out from the beginning that this is not a binary wherein I'm rejecting the space. However, it wasn't fulfilling what I needed to fulfill in my work. Uh, and my work uh, in the last few years has been, in fact, to quit curating. <laughs> uh, and so I'm going to speak from this position where uh, I'm no longer curating uh, in the same way uh, that I had been experienced in the past. And I did start as an artist and in many ways, the work of curating was also conflated with my work uh, uh, as an activist and making space. And when I saw that uh, though I had made the space, though we had brought in great indigenous artists into the gallery as per a generation of artists before me and before them, uh, that where I didn't see the reflection was in the audience of the gallery. And so I felt like, why am I always asking my relatives, my community uh, to come to the gallery when that's just inherently a difficult space uh, for people to come to or an uncommon space or a space where people have all kinds of other expectations and ideas. And so I really wanted to take my work outside of the gallery and, um, and be based in the community. And so I start to think of that um, and my own interest in practicing Indigenous resurgence as in fact a recentering. And I think my work has been about recentering in the last while. And so this is an example of sort of the start of some of that work. Um, it is a manifesto written by my, collaboratively by myself and Peter Morin and Gabriel Hill, other artists I work with, in an uh, inaugural residency, that's R-E-Z, as in uh, the reserve. Uh, and it's, it is a place on my uh, land on reserve. Uh, and we got together and we wrote this manifesto. And I'm just going to read you, this is, uh, we then later on laser etched it onto birch bark with a project um, the uh, for the pedagogical impulse. It was the instant class kit that was a project by Vesna Kitchener and Stephanie Springay at the University of Toronto. But this is an excerpt of the uh, manifesto. So um, Bush Gallery is alive and breathing. Bush Gallery is on Indigenous land. Bush Gallery is animate and inanimate at the same time. Bush Gallery is radically inclusive. All bodies and lands and kids and dogs and bears are welcome. Bush Gallery requires new words. Bush Gallery includes working the land. Bush Gallery includes walking the land. Bush Gallery includes conversations with kids. Bush Gallery includes moms and dads and caregivers. Bush Gallery includes all Indigenous languages. Within Bush Gallery, we understand that Indigenous languages are spoken with hands and the movements of bodies, with the tongue, with the movement of mouths, with laughter, with tears, and with righteous anger. And the context of Bush Gallery is uh, a rural area uh, on a small reserve outside of a small town, uh, outside of a smaller regional center in the interior of British Columbia. So um, when we sort of talk about margins or periphery, I'm, I'm definitely like in the bush. And so I've centered that uh, in my work. In fact, I can't actually join you from Bush Gallery today because ever since uh, all the difficulties and um, people returning and being at home, it means that my satellite internet doesn't <laughs> any longer work there. Um, and so I'm in the town of Chase, which is still part of our traditional territory. And that brings me to this image. This is an image of chiefs and delegates who are going uh, on their way to London uh, to uh, discuss land rights, indigenous lands rights, Sukhwatmuk land rights with the king. And this is uh, in the mid 1920s after a series of other delegations that in fact, some of my family members were a part of. And, uh, and this is why I wanted to revisit the idea of recentering. So what did it mean for me to be curating works in galleries when in fact, it was another layer of distancing and displacing me from my land, which is another furtherance of colonial um, 
uh, dispossession of my land. And so the container of Bush Gallery, which for me metaphorically is a, is a basket, a birch bark basket, um, it's able to contain these different uh, streams. So whereas I found myself uh, as an artist or a curator or a mother feeling like I had to be between those things, Bush Gallery allows me to bring that uh, together and to focus on land rights. And so this is one of the first works curated at Bush Gallery. This is performance documentation from a work called Light Pole Teepee. And it's by the Key Collective, which is Cheryl LaRondell and Joseph Netauhau. And it's by, the image here is by a young photographer, Aaron Leon, who is Sukhwatmuk. And so this really allowed me to recenter work, um, importantly, outdoors, on the land, within this container where I can um, have my kids. These, the, some of the kids you see in the image are my nephews. Um, a great little anecdote about this is my niece was here and, and she was watching us all um, assemble with these uh, flashlights and smudge, which forms the poles of this teepee. And she was asking her mom out loud, is, is this art? And uh, then she paused and she answered her own question. She was like, oh, this is good art. <laughs> and it was this wonderful moment where she felt engaged as opposed to the space of like, don't touch within the gallery, which I've also been in charge of enforcing. Um, this is an image uh, called uh, the, After the Good, the Bad and the Ugly, which is, uh, um, was a German feminist photograph. It's again taken by Aaron Leon and assembled um, by Amy Kazmierczyk and it features uh, other artists, Gabriel Lorondel Hill, Amy Kazmierczyk, Janine Freyna Jutley and myself who are engaged in a project in the winter at Bush Gallery filming a work, Coney Island Baby, which became an exhibition uh, that was led by Gabriel Hill. Uh, this quickly is an image of cyanotypes. We also did a lot of photograms and sun printings, ways of collaborating with the land. Uh, and these are examples of um, cyanotypes, small ones I brought as a workshop to the Shinta Center for Research and Technology, which has been a very influential uh, program that uh, is about teaching uh, land-based skills uh, and colloquially known as Bush University, which I had heard from my uh, language teacher and had sparked all kinds of ideas and I had a chance to visit uh, and continue to work with them. So again, this idea of Bush Gallery is a container, is a way for me to um, work collaboratively, socially engaged um, within the context of land rights and allow those things to be together as opposed to always needing to be pulled apart uh, and rarefied in their own particular um, streams. Uh, and that continues to inform uh, much of the work I do today. Uh, this is an example of an artwork I did with the um, University of Toronto Mississauga campus, uh, where these wind socks were also um, generating poetry through correlating a bank of words drawn from ecological management documents and the um, water claim of the Mississaugas of the Credit. And they would collate to wind measurements and write poetry. And it was a way of relating a uh, Sokwamuk story, actually. And so this practice of visiting and protocols to other territories has become an extension of Bush Gallery uh, that I refer to as citation. And uh, finally, this is an image recently of Bush Gallery's Beach Fire Blanket Bingo Biennial as part of the Toronto Biennial. And here um, we brought a group of people and we uh, enacted uh, sharing uh, on the beach. Um, we were catered by Pow Wow Cafe and we were um, inviting the public to gather around the beach fire in engaging in methodologies of exchange embedded in gift economies and philosophies. And so we played this elaborate game of uh, Indian bingo. Excuse me, that's the train in my small town in the background. So um, the work examined different modes of exchange and circulation of materials within and outside of the art system, which is primarily the, what I'm interested in or invested in now, uh, and Indigenous communities. And so in this image, we posed for a group photo at the lodge on Wards Island, where we enacted the project, because the um, historic building had many sort of images uh, from past that were primarily images of colonial occupation of space for picnics and sports. And so we um, created this new uh, group photo. Um, and so uh, in conclusion, my work has really been about recentering and recentering through Indigenous land rights and collaborative practices uh, and really relearning and practicing Indigenous resurgence for Sukhwatmuk ways, but finding a way to also importantly share that, um, like with you here today, because certainly what I don't want to do is impose my, on my set myself the borders in which the reservation system sets up. And so for me, it's about celebrating the land that's there 
and, uh, and taking up my rights and asserting my rights um, to create space for art there. Thank you. Fantastic. And then I think uh, Elisa will be our final uh, speaker. Um, so if uh, she could just share her screen. I don't know if you have to stop sharing your screen, Tanya. I think I just did, did I? Yeah. Oh, perfect, you did. You nailed it. Thank <laughs> you. Okay, great. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I'll hand it over to Elisa. Thank you. Is that coming through? Excellent. So um, hello and thank you for having me. Uh, it's a privilege to be co-organizing this panel, um, big fans of Emily and Tanya, and to speak alongside. Um, as Emily mentioned, Emily McKibben mentioned, uh, I've worked in both the public and private sectors. Uh, so today I'll just sort of be speaking from a, a kind of more traditional and general, almost emerging um, practice uh, as a curator in the public sector. Um, but to share um, how kind of uh, spending time um, taking the opportunity to work in the public sector at a regional gallery uh, gave me an opportunity to really think about how that would shape my practice uh, in that context. And I was really confronted with how to respond meaningfully to place and community, but without being defined as outside of a center um, or a, a here and there kind of construction. Uh, Latcham Art Center, um, where I became curator a few years back, uh, is outside of Toronto, about 45 minutes, um, Toronto being a major city center, and had, uh, has like a long 40-year history, uh, and of course has grown over that time. And part of the appeal of joining the team at that time is that they were um, in a real big period of growth and they're going to be moving to a dedicated art space uh, within a community center. And this was really appealing to me. It's a, a common model in a lot of regional places or places outside of major centers. And I thought this was a good recipe for success, particularly for this town, because it has a long history of being quite rural um, or, you know, outside of the city. But as the gallery has evolved, of course, so has the town and the demographics and diversity has shifted and the population has grown a great deal. So it was a moment for a time of, of reflection and maybe reconsidering um, new ways of thinking about how to activate that space and what determines the kind of programming that can kind of happen there. Um, I think the, the biggest thing for me was uh, thinking of, around um, giving the community agency and, and not thinking around um, that there was a defined uh, set of themes that could only be dealt with at the gallery, which was sort of moments that I, I felt were kind of sticking around from, from a while. And I kind of saw myself not as an outsider, but um, a, a new territory to really engage with and learn about in a different kind of way. Um, and I, I just wanted to also mention that the community center aspect being in a building with the library and other community services um, really provided an opportunity to create a community hub for the gallery so that it wasn't this like insular destination and sometimes in really small scale places uh, it makes it more difficult to kind of get those folks uh, into the gallery. Um, and so with uh, a couple of things like open calls and annual jury shows, some, some kind of strong pillars that really help with, um, that work really well in the, some of these smaller institutions, giving uh, local and regional artists an opportunity to participate in the gallery um, were really uh, elements that, that worked really well, but it was about making sure that we were offering broad, complex themes for the community to respond to. Um, and we had some really great success with uh, open call around activism that ended up um, yielding a, quite a, a show around like feminism and performative works. So it just created somewhat challenging conversations and topics that maybe on the outside would seem that that's not somewhere we could go in that space, um, but helped turn maybe some tides that that of course can be and be activated in lots of different ways. And, and same with the, the juried shows, bringing in art professionals and curators um, so artists and the community can hear from other people and really think about partnerships. 
Um, partnering with other communities was, of course, really important. Um, and we found some great success in thinking of how to extend or activate um, when we ha had the pleasure of working with artists um, that maybe could really benefit um, sharing their work elsewhere to other communities that maybe didn't have uh, dedicated gallery spaces or things like that. Um, and so Latcham Art Center already had a partnership with Ontario Tech U, um, a place in Oshawa, sort of also not a major city center, but not a small town, um, and with a great indigenous uh, student center. And to be able to bring the artists there and bring that conversation there uh, sort of works for both parties and created great opportunities. And we did that with Rosalie Favel um, and her work. Um, and then also uh, how to broaden dominant themes or narratives that sometimes can seem to be defined in a smaller institution. A lot of small scale places, well, everybody relies the public sector greatly on funding, fundraising, and certainly government funding. Um, and I, I was kind of surprised by the way that when you're writing these grants, sometimes you do need to think about like what defines your space and how does it separate you from other organizations? And, and that can be really useful in a lot of ways um, if you're kind of programming in a traditional, you know, for the general public um, within a white cube. Um, but I wanted to be sure that we weren't like allowing that to define um, how the programming would roll out. Uh, so we had a chance to work with Laura Moore um, and her work, uh, an exhibition called Memory Bathing that was really around so, so riffing on notions of like environment connected to the kind of rural urban versus urban conversation that was one of the kind of dominant threads um, in the gallery's identity. Um, but this is a way of at least bringing in a different kind of conversation still, of course, like reflecting on, on the time now, looking at how information is passed in nature on a cellular level and how that's analogous to the memory capacity of USB technology uh, and just allowing that to engage through audio and poetry and drawings and different kinds of media. Uh, I think in the context of programming for a general public, um, in a quote unquote regional setting, uh, taking steps to ensure we don't prescribe to the notion that there is only like one dominant rigid sort of narrative to address um, was really key. And regardless of location um, to provide a platform for artists who speak to ideas and experiences um, that are vast and related to identity and race, um, ensuring that that space celebrates uh, diverse representation and isn't defined by any past or traditional notions of rural or non-urban. Um, and a highlight for me was working with uh, Camille Turner and Kamal Pirapai on an exhibition called Where We Stand. Um, this series uh, of work called Wanted, um, pardon me, I triggered Siri for some reason there, <laughs> um, is a, a really impactful um, body of work, uh, part of which was shown in a big group survey show at the Art Gallery of Ontario um, called Every Now and Then Reframing Nationhood. Um, but this gave an opportunity for the artists to show the whole series in this um, body that they did and, um, and bring this kind of really difficult, challenging conversation to the gallery. Uh, Wanted series is based on um, advertisements of runaway enslaved people in Canada. So looking at slavery in Canada, um, which is not something strongly reflected uh, in our curriculum and, and in history classes, um, and kind of reimagining these individuals and paying homage to them in these, um, these empowered celebratory ways that riff on fashion advertising and, and advertising in general. And it was just a, a really rewarding um, activation uh, to bring this kind of conversation to, to the space um, and allow people to just sort of engage uh, in, in thinking about these kinds of conversations and to, to sort of demonstrate that, of course, it's, it's very viable to do that for all ages. And um, we had so many people come out to the gallery that hadn't come out before, and it really like resonated of, of how you just don't want to make assumptions about, about place and what boundaries you think articulate um, yeah, place or space and, and just the way that it can apply to all ages. Um, 
and in essence, just so we can get to uh, our conversation, because I know the time is, is quickly slipping away. Um, just again, for me uh, in this experience, just thinking around um, the role or function of the gallery space to articulate certain things. So if celebrating an anniversary, it's not necessarily didactic or explicit around like what's happened in the past of this organization, but really about like what a gallery can do for a community or for the and the general public and how to bring artists together. And so in this case, we brought together an emerging mid-career and established artists, some that had a relationship to the gallery in the past and some who didn't um, as a way to sort of celebrate the passing of time um, in that kind of scenario. And finally, uh, just working again um, in partnership uh, bringing stories from elsewhere to the space uh, sometimes in a very small scale space it's not always viable to apply for certain grants or to have the the person power to do so um, and so you can leverage the success of other places um, the final show I, I had the privilege of working on um, uh, at the gallery was with Jason Berg and this was a show that was developed in collaboration um, at an artist rent center uh, in Regina called Neutral Ground. Uh, and it just allowed that, that the, much of that work was already assembled. So that whole story was able to be um, shared here uh, in, in a way that wouldn't have been able to necessarily done from the ground up. Um, so it's just really about like leveraging other places successes and just not seeing it as like these separate individual insular kind of spaces. Um, yeah, I just think in, in essence, it's about how to celebrate like the useful aspects of regionalism without letting it um, dictate what we can and cannot do. Uh, for me, as a like foray into a small scale um, regional space was the um, sort of the big challenge and the, the uh, big lesson that I tried to, uh, yeah, consider how it shaped my practice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elisa and Emily and Tanya. Um, perfect, I've got my sound on. Um, when Elisa and I were first uh, planning uh, the session, we were kind of coming on as super fans. So this has been a really wonderful experience listening to you talk about your practices. Um, we've got about 20 minutes. Uh, we've got to end um, at about 2.15 sharp our time, so 15 past the hour. So I'm just gonna go straight into questions from the audience and um, the first question I'd like to pose to you is a question about um, building new relationships with the community. Uh, and this is coming from someone working at a university gallery with a small staff of three. Emily, uh, I was reading an interview with you uh, when you were nominated for the Margot Beinhardt and Rita Davies Award for Cultural Leadership. Um, and I was struck by um, something you said about how you've transformed over the course of, I think, 13 years at AGYU, is that right? 17 now. 17, 17, okay, perfect. Uh, over the course of, it happens fast. <laughs> Time flies. <laughs> Time flies. Well, I, I, part of your curatorial practice seems to be a sort of transformation of um, institutional practice there. Uh, my favorite part of the interview is where you say, um, uh, relationships where timelines and deadlines don't, don't get killed. Uh, relationships don't get killed by uh, timelines and deadlines, which I love because I, I do kill relationships with timelines and deadlines often. Um, so maybe could you could you speak about um, how you built relationships within the Jane Finch corridor, within the university community, what resources you drew on? For sure. I mean, I think that temporality is a big um, part of building relationships and to think beyond project by project, whether those are timeline based or just exhibition based. I mean, so much of inherited institutional practice is to turn over exhibitions. And in doing that, sort of treat everything from diversity to community to whatever, to anything as subject matter. And so I think it's very important to set one's intentions in the long term because it takes a long time to build trust. And I think that already working within um, our institutional frame, but also within a university, 
the university that I work with, work at, is um, very much nestled in a community that's quite alienated from the university itself. So not only are we building trust, like interpersonal relationships, but I have also like inherited a, a history of like institutional mistrust. Um, and so I think time is really important and actually, um, in that interview, I also talk about how my whole social life changes with every <laughs> project. When the projects are like three years for me, so I'm like growing with these people, all of everybody. And so I go to the events that all of the people that I'm collaborating with are hosting. Um, and I don't, you know, that work doesn't sort of happen between nine and five. Um, but you it's it's like another way of doing i think like uh sort of socially engaged curatorial research where you're like with people at their events and like parkour meets and poetry slams and getting a real understanding and respect for their time and i mean i work a lot with international artists in collaboration with local folks um and every time i bring an international artist in they meet with the mississaugas of the credit they meet with the poets and rappers of jane finch whether they're going to work together or not it doesn't matter to me but i continually engage everybody that i have worked with over the past 17 years over and over and over again because i believe that they are now part of the fabric of the agyu itself and that there has to be if we're going to build a relationship with an international artist and present their work to audiences here, then I want to know that the folks that I've been collaborating with over the past decade or so also really dig that work. Really, that's, um, that's a really uh, fantastic answer and certainly um, the enthusiasm you have for your, for the artists you work with, for the community you work with is, is really wonderful. Um, we had another question from the audience, and I'll address this one to Tanya. Um, sorry, I'm not finding my chat function. Um, you had, and this sort of builds on questions about relationships as well. Um, we have someone in the audience who is hoping you could speak more about the residency program at Bush Gallery uh, and how that relates to cultivating land-based skills for artists and for curators and for people in the community. Sure. Uh I'm just making sure I'm not muted. Um, well, let me start by saying, though I talk about um, Bush Gallery at different events and it's my way of connecting it to a wider conversation about contemporary art, it's an unfunded space. So um, it's on reserve. I worked very hard to build a home there in the last uh, little while. So it's it does have this other role as also being um, literally my home. So, uh, so projects that happen there I will say are defined exactly not by timelines and deadlines, but happen a bit more um, this backwards, um, but happen a bit more serendipitously or through in, in, in instinct or I just allow like what I would be very suspicious of in terms of organizing as a curator within a, a gallery context. I just let happen. Um, and so the residency has been um, funded largely through Canada Council for the Arts um, National Aboriginal Exchange Program. Uh, and we've done that just a few um, short years. Uh, and then we were also invited um, by um, Jennifer Papararo and um, Winnipeg uh, Plugin um, to do one of their summer institutes. Actually, it's one of the first times we took some of the work of Bush Gallery to another uh, territory. Uh, and I was really nervous about that idea, but we actually also recentered the project to be about um, uh, to be inclusive of uh, also um, uh, uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color as the kind of centering that we were working with. And we built really amazing relationships through that program. So um, I guess the, the point is that it's spotty um, and it happens when the right kind of mix uh, is happening. And uh, in the last little while, I've been again kind of stepping back and recentering 
um, with this new appointment I have at the University of British Columbia uh, in the Okanagan campus in Seal territories. I've been kind of waiting to see what is the right space of Bush Gallery now. I will say that in this current context of being uh, not, uh, galleries not being open uh, and social distancing, um, I, Bush Gallery and homeschooling, I'll say, because that definitely affects me. I have two young children who are now um, in online classes and managing that. All of that stuff is uh, how I centered Bush Gallery in, in the first place. So though the project we were intending to do can't happen because it involved gathering with elders, um, what I think about now is, is the, in terms of Bush Gallery is that though through social distancing, I can't make the residency happen in the same way. And it doesn't happen every year anyway. It sort of happens in different forms. Um, there is a lot of earth closening that we can do. So part of that, the counterpoint to that social distancing for me has been earth closening because I already live in quite a rural, quite a removed, quite an isolated uh, context in some ways as other people might view it. And so, um, so that basket, that container uh, um, is able to hold all that and, and the residencies and the programs sort of happen when they can because the last thing I want to do is make Bush Gallery uh, a, 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 a responsibility, a commitment that becomes difficult for me to manage in terms of having passion for it. So it's an ecology and in an ecology, you're, you're always surprised. You might, you know, something might have eaten all of this crop for that year or this wild thing or, or you find something. And, and so I let that, um, those events that happen within an ecology just happen. And, and at times I'm in the right place to uh, leverage something for Bush Gallery. Oh, that's, that's, um, that's fantastic. So we've got about 10 minutes. So maybe I'll, I'll push the question over to Elisa as well. Um, you were working when you were at the Latin Art Center in a mixed use facility which shared space with the library and with the rec center, is that correct? Yeah. And so uh, when, you, when you entered that space and the gallery started up, how, how were you able to maintain those um, uh, partnerships? Were, were you able to sort of maintain them only on a project by project basis or did you have a kind of longer through line with them? It's a, a, a great question. Um, it was something that you wanna have that through line and it's you know, this, this con concept of time and trust and building relationships is, is just so key. Uh, and there was a lot of, um, let's call it foundational conversations and planning um, to try to try to get some of that off the ground. And so there were a few partnerships that happened uh, stemming out of projects. Um, yeah, and with it, with the idea to hope to have that kind of through line. Um, but it is, it's, it's so tricky. You just really kind of realize it's so hard to break these like institutional or organizational um, parameters. And especially if you're kind of tied into a municipality or a city, and I'm sure on larger scales with the university, there's always uh, in those kinds of contexts, um, these things that kind of provide these definitions of what can happen, what can't. Um, so it, it was an incredible experience because although I was like banging my head against the wall for a lot of that learning curve, um, it helped open my eyes to, you know, these, these parameters at play. Um, and how, how do you partner, like take some of those things out of the equation. So it's just about having like actionable projects and, um, and partnerships and relationships. So we did a lot of small activations, um, certainly through our education programming, um, like outside of the, the curatorial, but in, in the, uh, the, what was called the education programming. Uh, so more of, of the classes and, and uh, um, school opportunities. Well, I think uh, we've got to be out of here uh, in about eight minutes. Um, so I thought perhaps the um, last thing that might be worth talking about is um, the, the elephant in the room is that sort of all of us are not working right now or working remotely or um, Emily, I know you mentioned, you and Tanya mentioned that you've gotten something like 400 viewers on some of your remote programs. Um, maybe just using this last sort of little bit, we can talk about um, uh, you know, what we're doing now that we have no kind of center to work from now that our galleries are closed, now that we're, we're in our living rooms, uh, 23 hours of the day. Um, 
I guess uh, I'm, I'm less uh, in my living room, though I am at times, but it's spring. Spring has come um, to my territory and a lot of our um, traditional roots foods are coming up and flocks of birds are coming through. And uh, though I have, you know, the deepest sympathy for all of the challenges this has uh, led people to face, um, the, the, con the kind of architecture of Bush Gallery ha has meant that everything there is still kind of there. Um, and I am in this um, privileged um, and committed and responsible position to, to be a witness um, to that. And so um, I, for myself, it's important to have these times of rest and, and the way that Bush Gallery has been structured is not according to a gallery cycle. Um, for better or worse. And so uh, I, I have this space of rest, which I think is so important for artists and curators. I think um, that uh, though it's obviously very tragic that we can't be in spaces, um, it's, it's a place to rest and reflect, I think. Um, for me, I feel um, quite comfortable with the temporality, just to even riff off what Tanya's saying, of um, having actually feeling like um, that I have a real reason to practice my uh, kind of temporality in, in developing projects. I didn't feel an impulse to make things public or to develop an online complementary program at the HYU, although um, we have been hosting this thing called Remote Control, which was with the poets and rappers from the Jane Finch community and the Scarborough community, but it, it felt very natural and it felt like a flow. Like, And we chose Instagram because it's a platform they all love, but it also supports like a kind of call and response. So like inherently like black diasporic practices, people are like snapping, um, you know, we are able to get an international audience for these local poets and rappers who are incredibly talented. So I, and I think that remote control will continue uh, as a ongoing program. So there isn't those distinctions. And, and then I was like, well, if we're gonna be on Zoom, um, I spend once a week hosting a Zoom hangout between poets and rappers from the Jane Finch community and the Saugeen First Nation. And they're all singers and poets and rappers. Um, and it has afforded us the opportunity to hang out together with like no strings attached, with no end goal in mind, um, with nothing that's shaping our hangout other than sharing our work and you know I always think that's the ideal and always feel a bit of external pressure and desires for this way of working for it to be like led into a direction and become public and all of a sudden I feel very relieved um, that those pressures are actually not there. I, I agree. I'll, I'll just add that I think I'm really grateful that it's given us, us this time to slow down, especially if, if there's any of us that need that extra reminder. Not everybody does, but it's like that kind of forced um, zoom out. And it's been really amazing to see how people have responded. And it, it's kind of creating these, these new access points and forcing people to, you know, actually reflect on what it is they're doing, why they want to do it. And I know that that's impacting the work that I'm doing. And uh, I'm super grateful to have that time. And hopefully we, will, we won't lose sight of all of this uh, mm -hmm. as things return to different accessibilities and, and new normals. Yeah. yeah, and on that front, I mean, I just have to say that we won't return to a status quo. And I'm like really cool with that. Yeah. And I feel like this time is an opportunity to like deeply consider what isn't working um, and to not return to what isn't working and to think about what, to imagine, um, you know, not returning to a status quo um, in our institutional practice anyway. Yeah, I think Emily, that's such a good point. I'll just add that one of the points of Bush Gallery has also been about um, showing the disparity uh, to arts and culture funding um, infrastructure programming that just doesn't occur on um, Indian reservations. Uh, and it does 
it doesn't occur there, not because we're not interested in art, um, but because of um, formational kinds of um, public uh, culture policy um, directions that exclude us. Uh, and so the, the importance of like highlighting that disparity is so important right now too, um, that, that so many other uh, folks are having a hard time. The way it's hit the Navajo reservation is really scary for us um, in terms of elders who carry so much knowledge. And so um, within that time to rest and reflect is also to, I think, to build up our reserves, um, to build up, <laughs> there's a pun intended there, but to build <laughs> 